Today I'm going to discuss a theory that was made popular in the 2004 documentary Britain's Real Monarch. You can view that documentary right here on YouTube by following the link in the description. Britain's Real Monarch was hosted by actor Tony Robinson, who is best known for playing Baldrick in the show Black Adder. In the documentary, he argues that the current queen is not the legitimate monarch, and that the rightful monarch is actually a rather ordinary guy living in Australia. So I'm going to show you some family trees in order to explain the theory, and then at the end, I'm going to give you my opinion on it. Let's start off with a quick recap of the Wars of the Roses. In the late medieval period, England had a king named Edward III from the House of Plantagenet. He had a nice long reign of 50 years. He had five sons, but because of his long life, he actually outlived his first two sons. Now, you might think that the throne would therefore pass to his third son. However, most European monarchies follow a system known as primogeniture, which means that whenever possible, titles get passed down from firstborn to firstborn and so on. So the firstborn son of a firstborn son actually takes precedence over all of his uncles. So when Edward III died, the throne passed directly to his grandson, Richard II. But Richard II ended up being quite a nasty king. So in 1399, many of the nobles rallied together and had him deposed. Now, Richard II did not have any children, and by then, John, Duke of Lancaster, had died. So the next most senior male in the line of succession was Henry Bolingbroke, who therefore became King Henry IV. And this is where the roots of the Wars of the Roses began. You see, at this point, it hadn't yet been firmly established whether England should follow male-only primogeniture or whether it should follow male-preference primogeniture. Male-only, of course, means that only males can inherit, and this is what Henry IV based his claim on, being that he was the next most senior male. However, if male preference had been followed, it would have meant that the line could pass through a female so long as that female did not have any brothers. So being that Philippa here was an only child, under the male preference system, the throne should have passed through her. Now, she was actually dead by 1399, and so was her firstborn son, Roger. But Roger had a son named Edmund, who was living at the time. So really, the throne should have gone straight from Richard II to Edmund. But it didn't. It went to Henry IV, and then it went to Henry V, and then it passed on to Henry VI. But by this point, the situation had changed. First of all, Edmund died childless. However, he had an older sister who had a son named Richard. So when Edmund died, Richard became the most senior person in this line. And not only could Richard claim that he was the legitimate king of England based on the male preference rules, he also happened to be a direct male-only line descendant of Edward III through his father. So based on these facts, the Wars of the Roses began. The Yorkists, represented by the White Rose, argued that Richard was the true king. The Lancastrians, represented by the Red Rose, defended King Henry VI. Now, if you were to just look up here at the Sons of Edward III, you might think that, well, Lancaster comes before York, and therefore the Lancasters were more senior. However, the Yorkists did not stake their claim based on their York roots. They based it instead on this female line here. Initially, the Lancastrians held on to power, and Richard of York and his second son, Edmund, were killed. 
But the eldest son continued to fight and eventually scored a big victory. He became king in 1461. Henry VI managed to take back the throne briefly, but then Edward IV won again. So with the Yorkist win, it looked like things were back on track. But when Edward IV died, things got complicated yet again. His son Edward V was only 12 at the time, so basically his uncle Richard over here was left in charge. And before the young boy was crowned, uncle Richard dropped a bombshell. He claimed that Edward IV had had a secret first marriage and that therefore Edward V and his siblings were all illegitimate, being that their parents' marriage was illegal. Suddenly, young Edward and his brother Richard went missing, never to be seen again, and Richard III was named king. Now, you might ask, why did the throne pass to Richard when there was a more senior line here? Well, you see, George had fought alongside the Lancastrians, and although he was later forgiven for this, he later became involved in a plot against his older brother and was executed for treason. At the same time, he was stripped of all his titles, which meant that his descendants became illegitimate as well. So this left Richard as the only remaining heir. Which brings us to Henry VII and the Tudors. Henry had several ties to the Lancastrians. His father was the half-brother of Henry VI, and through his mother, he was actually a descendant of John, Duke of Lancaster, albeit through a non-royal line. Originally, John Beaufort was considered illegitimate because his mother was a mistress of the Duke of Lancaster when he was born. However, John was later declared legitimate by Richard II, and then later Henry IV said, yeah, he's legitimate, but he and his descendants are never allowed to be in the line of succession. So Henry's case for becoming king was not really based on his descent from Edward III. Instead, it was based on two other things. First, it was based on the right of conquest, which means that he and his armies fought Richard III and his armies and Henry I. Therefore, just like William the Conqueror, he became king by force. But second, in order to cement his claim even further, he married Elizabeth of York, daughter of Edward IV. He convinced people that this marriage had in fact been legal, and that the whole story of the first wife had been made up by Richard III in order to seize the throne. This made Elizabeth the most senior heir according to the male preference rules, and it also meant that all of their future descendants would have a better claim to the throne than anyone else. So this marriage was seen as the end of the Wars of the Roses, a unification of the Yorkist side with the Lancastrian side. And this was symbolized by the Tudor Rose, which combined the White Rose with the Red Rose. So again, things were back on track. From this point, we get the rest of the Tudor monarchs before the throne then passes to the Stuarts. This was the point in which England and Scotland began to share a monarch. But remember, the Stuarts did not take the throne of England by force. They were actually the most senior descendants of Henry VII after Henry VIII's line died out. The later Hanover monarchs which include Queen Victoria, were all direct descendants of this line. Although there's the whole Jacobite debate, and if you're interested in that, I've got a separate video on that topic, which I'll link to in the description. After the Hanovers, you get the House of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha, which ended up changing its name to Windsor. And the current monarch of the United Kingdom, Queen Elizabeth II, is the current head of that house and the most senior descendant of the Hanover line, according to the rules of male preference primogeniture. So Queen Elizabeth sits on the throne today because she's a direct descendant of this guy and of this guy and of this guy, and of course, this guy. And if we were to go back even further, we could also trace things back to William the Conqueror, Alfred the Great, and even Charlemagne. 
Okay, with that background, we're now ready to talk about the documentary Britain's Greatest Monarch. Tony Robinson's theory is based not on the claim that Edward IV's children were illegitimate, but that Edward IV himself was illegitimate. And all of it is based on the timing of Edward IV's birth. Edward IV was born on April 28, 1442 in France, while his father was there fighting in the Hundred Years' War. But according to some records from the time, Edward's father was off fighting at a location about 100 miles from where his mother was living for about a five-week period around the time in which Edward IV was likely conceived. The conclusion is that his mother must have had an affair and that Edward's father was therefore someone else. If this was true, Edward would indeed be illegitimate. And if he was, his children would also be illegitimate, including Elizabeth of York. And that means that everyone else from this point forward would also be illegitimate or at least not as senior because on his own, Henry VII could only claim the throne based on conquest, not on genealogy. So we would have no Tudors, no Stuarts, no Hanovers, no Windsors, no Queen Elizabeth II. So if this theory were true, who would be the rightful monarch? Well, that's the question that the documentary Britain's Real Monarch answers. And it starts with George, Duke of Clarence, who, as I mentioned earlier, was executed and stripped of all his titles by Edward IV. But if Edward IV was an illegitimate king, then George really didn't commit treason, did he? And if Edward IV was an illegitimate king, he didn't really have the right to strip anyone of his titles, did he? So, if we put George Duke of Clarence back in the line of succession, his line suddenly becomes the most senior one. George had a son, Edward, who died childless as the last male-only line member of the Plantagenet dynasty. And how did he die? He was executed by none other than Henry VII, who worked hard to get rid of any possible rivals for the throne. Edward did have a younger sister, though, and through her, the line continued. Eventually, the line married into the Hastings family, and therefore they inherited the earldom of Huntington. In fact, when Elizabeth I was queen and the nobles were wondering who her successor should be, Henry Hastings was actually one of the people considered. He, of course, wasn't chosen, though, and he actually died childless, so the line then continued through his younger brother, George. Eventually, we get to the point where there wasn't a son to inherit, so the line continued through the Rawdon Hastings family, John Rawdon having been an Irish nobleman. From there, we come to Edith Rawdon Hastings, who inherited the Earldom of Loudon in Scotland. She married Charles Abney Hastings and had a son named Pollen. And now we're getting fairly close to the present. Pollen was followed by his daughter Edith. Edith's only son died in World War II, so the line continued through her daughter Barbara instead. Barbara was a member of the House of Lords until 1999 and passed away in 2002. Her eldest son was named Michael. And it is Michael who appears in the documentary Britain's Real Monarch. Michael moved to Australia when he was a teen and ended up living as a farmer there for the rest of his life. In the documentary, Tony Robinson tracks down Michael in Australia walks up to his front door and gives him the news. Michael finds the whole thing very interesting, but doesn't sail off to London with an army to claim his supposed throne. The documentary was filmed in 2004, and Michael passed away in 2012. His eldest son, Simon, is therefore the current Earl of Loudoun and the most senior living heir of George, Duke of Clarence.
So if one accepts that Edward IV was illegitimate, then the argument is that Simon Abney Hastings is therefore Britain's real monarch. Okay, so what do I think of all of this? Well, first of all, let me say that for any country at any given time, the real monarch is always the one who is actually sitting on the throne. Genealogy is of course important, but what is even more important for a monarch is the support of the people. In the past, this mostly meant the support of the nobles. If the nobles were happy, the armies were happy, and if the armies were happy, you got to stay on the throne. Nowadays, it's a bit more complex. So long as the population of a country is happy with its monarchy, the monarchy is likely to continue. And it's actually the parliament that gives legitimacy to the monarch not having the perfect bloodline. That all being said, were Edward IV and his children legitimate or not? Well, we'll never be 100% certain, but my opinion is that he was in fact the true son of Richard of York, and that his marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was in fact legal. Several historians have looked into the claims made in the documentary Britain's Real Monarch and have countered that based on travel speeds, length of gestation, court politics, and so forth, it is actually more likely that Edward was legitimate than it is that he was not. Claims of illegitimacy did surface at the time, likely due to all of this family rivalry, but if those claims were true, they likely would have been fairly easy to prove at the time, and therefore Edward IV would never have become king. But he did. And again, I'm not saying that we can know all of this for sure, but I think it's safer to assume that he was legitimate than to assume that he was not. And even if he was not, there's still the fact that Henry VII claimed the throne based on conquest and that he was accepted by the people at the time, just like every other monarch after him. Well, except for Charles I. And there's also the fact that we have over 500 more years of British monarchs from 1485 to today, and that the current queen is certainly more connected to all of those famous monarchs than Simon Abney Hastings is. And who's to say that there's not some break in the chain somewhere in this line that we don't know about? So sorry, Simon, I've got nothing against you. You're a handsome guy, but I'm going to stick with Queen Elizabeth for now. Thanks for watching.